talk this morning about corneal wound healing, but in the context of some of the new uh, topical agents that are uh, either already available or I think will soon become available to modulate the uh, wound healing response and control some of the uh, problems that we see in patients in cornea clinic. Uh, I want to thank all of the fellows and residents who've worked with me uh, on projects related to this, uh, four of whom have won the uh, Troutman Award. And uh, recently, many of you know Rodrigo, who was here uh, for two years, uh, uh, won the Wearing a Medal and would be giving a lecture in New York at the OSN meeting on November 11th. And then uh, sitting in the audience are three of my current fellows. Uh, that are in the uh, orange at the bottom here. Um, we're going to talk about uh, these four uh, categories of agents, nerve growth factor, uh, Oxervate is the name uh, used by the company, uh, Lasartan and other ACE2 receptor blockers, and uh, some of the new uh, anti-neovascularization agents, uh, Suntanib and Extanib. And then uh, we're also going to talk about some of the Rho kinase or ROC uh, inhibitors. But first, we're going to kind of detail uh, a little bit about corneal wound healing. The corneal wound healing response roughly is a pathway, uh, but it's not like glycolysis or the Krebs cycle, it's not a sequence. Many of these things occur uh, at the same time, but it's useful to kind of show them in this manner uh, in which you see that either epithelial or endothelial injury, although you can also get limbal, for example, with some uh, immunological disorders and things like infections. Uh, but uh, usually we're talking about epithelial and or endothelial injury releases uh, a lot of cytokines and growth factors. The very first thing you see is keratocyte apoptosis uh, adjacent to the surface that's injured. And then uh, uh, corneal fibroblast generation, proliferation, and functions that they perform. Uh, myofibroblast differentiation uh, and the production of uh, different growth factors and collagens and glycosaminoglycans and uh, inflammatory cell infiltration, uh, the activation and production of collagenases and metalloproteinases, uh, eventually, hopefully, the epithelium or the endothelium closes, and uh, we get uh, eventually, hopefully, regeneration of the epithelial basement membrane or uh, decimase membrane if it's a, a posterior corneal injury. And over time, hopefully, those myofibroblasts disappear by apoptosis or transitioning back, although it's not clear that happens yet, but there's some in vitro data. And uh, corneal fibroblasts themselves disappear either by uh, transdifferentiation back to keratocytes or apoptosis. And then over time, you'll get a return to normalcy and epithelial thickness uh, in, in uh, a lot of corneas, although some can remain uh, permanently fibrotic uh, with, with severe injuries, and we'll talk about that. So the first things we see is, is uh, epithelial uh, and or endothelial damage and keratocyte apoptosis. Uh, this is actually the original uh, from my paper in 1994, the original uh, first description of keratocyte apoptosis. Uh, uh, on the left, the tunnel assay. Uh, four hours after uh, epithelial scrape injury in a mouse. And then the uh, uh, transmission electron micrograph uh, on the right side that shows the condensation of the chromatin and the formation of thousands of apoptotic bodies which contain the cytoplasmic contents from the cell that disperse throughout the tissue. Uh, this is a picture from a human uh, uh, with Renato Ambrosio when he was with me. 
uh, where we uh, got an IRB approval for a cor uh, an eye that was going to be removed for a choroidal melanoma to do an epithelial scrape injury four hours uh, before the enucleation, showing that this process occurs in humans also. And uh, we published a paper many years ago uh, showing, uh, comparing PRKs of different levels and LASIK and where this apoptosis occurs. And here you're seeing PRK for nine day after two examples at four hours, showing the variability that you can see between different corneas, uh, where the one on the left has more than the one on the right. And, and at 24 hours, you're still seeing apoptotic cells and 72 hours. Now at 72 hours, these aren't the same ones that were there at 24 hours, those are long gone. These are additional cells which may be invading cells such as we know that uh, uh, different types of immune cells are invading. Uh, and so those continue to go apoptosis, uh, undergo apoptosis. By one week, you can see in one cornea here, virtually that process has been completed on the right, but on the left, it's still going, going on with apoptosis. And by four weeks, very little, uh, just a few cells that you're detecting that are still undergoing apoptosis. And by three months in this model, uh, pretty much back to normal. Um, if you look at LASIK, the difference is that the apoptosis response occurs surrounding the interface, anterior and posterior. Uh, it's caused by uh, uh, either... Uh, a femtosecond laser, which causes most of this to actually be necrosis rather than apoptosis uh, from a paper that we published. Uh, but with a microkeratome, it goes through the uh, epithelium before it enters the stroma, and it drags some of the cytokines involved in this process into the stroma and triggers it. And you can see it's still at the interface. The, the, the significance of that is it's well away from the epithelium. Uh, because the wound healing response, when it's right next to the epithelium, causes much more changes such as hyperplasia to the epithelium uh, than uh, in PRK than, say, a LASIK uh, case. And uh, similarly, by, by uh, four weeks, there's very little uh, apoptosis in the stroma, and by three months, it's pretty much gone in, in most corneas. And if we graph this, uh, to show uh, time points versus the amount of apoptotic cells per 400x field. Uh, we see that uh, 9 after PRK has a much larger uh, apoptotic effect than a, a 4 and a half diopter PRK, and we'll get back to why that's important later, but a, a much greater wound healing response, the higher the correction, and LASIK, of course, with a 9 diopter correction is much less than, than any of the PRKs. And this is a, 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 an example we published uh, recently. Uh, actually, Carla Medros uh, did this, uh, where we injured the endothelium of rabbits, uh, did these experiments over 30 years apart. I always suspected the endothelium would do the same thing, and we finally got around to doing that by injuring the endothelium with a, a smooth tip cannula just rubbing on the endothelium, and four hours later, you see apoptosis in the posterior cornea uh, by uh, the same mechanisms from the endothelial side. How is the keratocyte apoptosis triggered? Uh, well, we showed in several papers uh, uh, dating back uh, 20 years now that cytokines released from the epithelium, uh, uh, mostly interleukin-1-alpha, uh, actually bind to receptors on the keratocytes. And uh, if, uh, if it's a microkeratome, again, it, they're drug in by the blade, the epithelial remnants. And they upregulate uh, in these cells, uh, uh, IL-1 triggers fast ligand production, and they constitutively or, com or, or permanently or constantly produce the fast receptor and so when they upregulate fast ligand, they kind of undergo autocrine suicide because they make fast ligand that binds the receptors and, and the cells undergo apoptosis. Uh, and this is just kind of showing uh, the, 
A, B, C, and D are examples in, in, in uh, vitro of cells hit with an anti-fast antibody that triggers uh, that receptor, or IL-1 does the same thing. And on the right, you see the typical laddering that you see in apoptosis, where the DNA is degraded into uh, uh, different chain links of DNA, and so you see this laddering pattern on a gel separating the DNA fragments. Why does this occur? Well, we hypothesized early on that this might be an early defense mechanism against viruses such as smallpox, uh, herpes, all the different viruses that can affect, infect the corneal epithelium and set up a, a little firewall uh, while you're waiting for the regular immune responses to be able to, to, uh, to occur uh, to stop the invasion of the virus. And we actually uh, have cases where it seems like uh, the infectious process of the herpes virus extends into the stromal cells, and those eyes are typically catastrophically affected by the infection. Uh, the late James Hill and I did an experiment where we took rabbits, uh, and uh, here you see a scrape, uh, just a regular epithelial scrape control, and you see an uninfected control, and then at 12 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours after uh, uh, epithelial infection with herpes simplex virus, if you look at with a tunnel assay, the underlying uh, keratocyte cells are undergoing apoptosis in those corneas. So when that happens, uh, the remaining uh, keratocytes that haven't uh, undergone cell death, many of them transition to corneal fibroblasts, which we'll take a talk about in a moment, and um, the, uh, they un start undergoing proliferation. Uh, the first time I presented the apoptosis work in 1994 at Arvo, uh, uh, had a very esteemed group there, including David Morris, the very famous corneal physiologist, and David Morris uh, had a, a British accent and uh, uh, any person that gave a lecture at Arvo, if he got up to ask a question act, after the lecture, would uh, send terror into your heart. And so sure enough, he was the first one up to the podium after my talk. And uh, he said, young man, I was a young man back then, uh, are you insinuating that keratocytes can undergo mitosis? Because I showed that this, this uh, apoptosis uh, occurred, but within a few weeks, the density of keratocytes returned to normal. And I said, well, Dr. Morris, uh, we, I can't prove that yet, but it must be happening because otherwise the density couldn't return to normal the way that it does. Well, my late great friend, uh, Jim Ziske, uh, who was at Scapins in Harvard, and his group a couple of years later showed this in this beautiful image uh, that is still one of my favorites, um, where they took uh, rat corneas and injured the epithelium and then stained them at different time points for KI67, a marker that's expressed in any cell undergoing my mitosis. And what they found uh, uh, was that, that uh, Th this was 36 hours later, the epithelium had already healed. Notice that epithelial cells as a part of their normal physiology undergo apoptosis and are shed. But in the stroma surrounding the area where the uh, apoptosis occurred, the, the residual keratocytes were starting to undergo proliferation. This is on the left side, the posterior of the cornea beneath where the apoptotic uh, response was immediately after and over on the right side. So they definitely undergo uh, mitosis. And similar, similar to apoptosis, the mitosis also varies with the different procedures being much greater in a minus nine diopter PRK than a four and a half diopter PRK and both of those being greater than a, a nine diopter LASIK. Uh, we published that together, uh, Jim Ziske and I, years later in a paper in experimental eye research. Uh, 
uh, that's still highly cited to this day. Um, the corneal fibroblast and myofibroblast differentiation we know is driven by uh, primarily TGF-beta-1 and TGF-beta-2, along with PDGF, uh, and we'll get back to that in more detail later. Uh, if if uh, myofibroblasts are generated, one of our earliest clues as to how this whole biology worked was that they would always appear immediately beneath the epithelium in a PRK procedure. And here we see at one month, rabbits, uh, this occurs much faster than in humans. So at, at one month, uh, the myofibroblasts reach their peak in, after PRK in the rabbit. And by three months, you can see they're disappearing uh, in the rabbit. By six months, uh, they're much further reduced. And by a year, they're pretty much gone in a rabbit at least most of them. And again, if we graph this, the amount of uh, the alpha smooth muscle actin positive cells over time in the different procedures, it's a much greater number of these are generated with a high correction PRK than a low correction PRK. And that same thing happens uh, uh, in humans. Uh, if we're gonna get uh, late haze, which is the term, clinical term for uh, corneal fibrosis, scarring fibrosis, then it, it typically peaks in humans around three months, and it can take a year or two or longer for it to resolve uh, in a human compared to the rabbit. It's a good thing the rabbits are faster. We could have never afforded to do all of these studies that we've done. Uh, so why don't haze and myofibroblasts appear clinically in the cornea until two weeks to three months after PRK? And that's because the cells that differentiate into myofibroblasts undergo a differentiation process that takes some time. And it, in a human cornea, it can occur as early as two, work, two weeks in a very severe injury. But for example, in a PRK, the classic story is you do a nine after PRK on patients, they're doing fantastic. And then about three months after surgery, you get a call that they've noticed over the last week that their vision has declined. Uh, they can still see up close because if they were a myope to begin with, but their, their distance vision has gone away and you would get a sickening feeling in your stomach uh, because this was before mitomycin C you knew what you were gonna see and they would come in and sure enough, they would have uh, corneal haze or scarring fibrosis. And so uh, an example of this differentiation, uh, we did an experiment on rabbits at, uh, one, at different time points after uh, nine after PRK. And you can actually see in this photograph that unwounded is at the top. And then the, as the weeks go by, if you look at vimentin, Initially, this is an antibody concentration for vimentin that's a lower concentration. And if you use a low concentration, you can only detect in the unwounded cornea a few cells that are positive for vimentin near the epithelium or on the other side of the cornea near the endothelium, which have some kind of difference in phenotype from all of the other cells there. Uh, and, and these cells increase over time. By two weeks in this rabbit model, we're starting to see alpha smooth, smooth muscle actin uh, positive cells. So it's really taken two weeks to get a lot of this differentiation or at least a week and a half or something. And this continues with more of these cells becoming SMA positive and more of them accumulating there. And if you look at another marker, for myofibroblasts, it doesn't come in at the same time as SMA. Uh, it's actually much later, but by the time you get to four weeks in the rabbit, virtually all the cells are positive for both uh, SMA and Desmond. So there's, a, there's a, a process of differentiation that must occur before that uh, scarring fibrosis appears in those corneas. And like I said, in humans, this is usually around three months to four months. One of the key findings in my lab was a, a study uh, that uh, we did with Andre Torricelli, one of my fellows, and, it, and we discovered that uh, whether or not uh, 
a cornea develops uh, these myofibroblasts depends on what happens to the epithelial basement membrane. In the, in the normal basement, in the normal unwounded cornea, you can see the lamina lucida and lamina densa between the, beneath the epithelium. And in most four and a half diopter PRKs, by one month, that layer is returned. And that, that structure symbolizes uh, uh, although it's, it's probably an artifact of fixation, we know nowadays, the lamina lucida, lamina densa, it does tell you that the basement membrane had a normal structure. In a nine diopter PRK, however, virtually all of them, you can't detect with transmission electron microscopy, lamina lucida and lamina densa. There is some basement membrane components here, but it's not the normal structure that includes the components such as perlican and collagen-4 that actually block the entry of TGF-beta-1 and beta-2 into the stroma. And uh, here's a, a lower magnification picture in a rabbit showing you all these myofibroblast cells line up again underneath the epithelium, which was a key finding that, that there was something about what was happening there that was important in this overall process. Um, myofibroblasts are absolutely dependent uh, on a adequate and ongoing supply of TGF beta one and or TGF beta two, or they undergo apoptosis, or there's some evidence that they may be able to revert back to corneal fibroblasts. Oh, that's, that's only been shown in vitro to this point. And the source of the TGF beta for the most part is the tears, the epithelium, the endothelium, uh, and aqueous humor. Uh, if you get an endothelial injury, it's the aqueous humor. Uh, and if you have peripheral uh, endothelial cells there, they make TGF-beta-1 and TGF-beta-2 also. What are the pre precursor cells? Well, we've known forever that corneal fibroblasts in vitro can be transformed into myofibroblasts with TGF-beta in culture. Uh, but we suspected based on uh, findings in some other tissues that bone marrow derived cells uh, called fibrocytes may also be involved in this process. And to, to study that, we uh, obtained fluorescent green mice. These, this isn't Photoshop. Uh, these are real. And all of their cells express uh, the uh, green fluorescent protein. And if we take one of the normal mice and irradiate it and knock off all of its bone marrow derived cells and then do a transplant and wait a month or two, we can basically uh, repopulate their bone marrow and all of the cells, at least 90 to 95%, are, are GFP positive. And so if you do that, uh, here, this is an example, and if you take a control and you don't scrape it on the left, you really don't see very many of these uh, bone marrow derived cells enter in the cornea. Uh, whereas if you do a scrape injury, by 24 hours, massive numbers of these bone marrow derived cells are invading the cornea and that continues. It's even even greater amount by 72 hours. And I published this with Victor Perez, who used to be here and who's now at Duke. Sorry the Boston Red Sox got knocked out of the playoffs, if you see this, Victor. Um, Fibrocytes are really interesting cells. Uh, some of it's a bit of a mystery still, but Bukala first described these in mice in 1994. They have a series of, uh, of markers that kind of dis distinguish them from other bone marrow derived cells and other cells in general. Uh, CD34 positive and CD45 positive, having both of those markers is kind of a key differentiation. And we usually combine that with something like collagen one, which we can't do in the cornea because the whole cornea is collagen one, uh, a lot of it, uh, but other markers to, to kind of identify these cells. And we have some papers uh, showing that. Um, so we wanted to see, are those cells, are those bone marrow derived cells contributing to these myofibroblasts? And we used, uh, again, the fluorescent green mouse chimera, and we perform PTK, mice are somewhat resistant to getting scarring fibrosis. Uh, 
So uh, the way that we get them to do it is we make the surface even more irregular by doing a PTK through a screen, which my fellows are getting ready to do on some rabbits this weekend. And that causes the surface to be very irregular and the, the mice will then develop much more extensive uh, haze or, or stromal fibrosis. If you do that and then at one month you take the cornea and perform duplex immunohistochemistry for the alpha smooth muscle actin marker simultaneously for the green fluorescent protein, you'll find a large proportion of those myofibroblast cells still retain the green fluorescent protein marker, meaning they came from bone marrow derived cells, which were fibrocytes. And in a particular cornea, it can be 80% from the bone marrow, 20% from keratocytes or corneal fibroblasts, and it can be all the way to the other ratio. And, and we think that may have to do with why some corneas that get haze are steroid responsive that the, somehow those myofibroblasts retain sensitivity to topical steroids. And the ones that don't respond, which is unfortunately most of them, are uh, most of the cells came from corneal fibroblasts. Um, so both of those precursors are now documented to be uh, precursors for the myofibroblasts in the cornea. There's also some publications out there that it's less well documented, but uh, Schwann cells or epithelial mesenchymal transition. There's a couple of papers dealing with that where epithelial cells under certain circumstances can actually transition to become myofibroblasts. And there, there may be others too, you know. Uh, so, but, but most of the work has been on those. Uh, you see this inflammatory uh, cell infiltration, uh, a very complex mixture of bone marrow derived cells uh, in these corneas. How does this happen? How does the cornea know, you know, what cells to send in there? Well, we were interested in that a few years ago and we did gene array experiments with, in vitro where we took corneal fibroblasts and exposed them to IL-1 alpha or TNF alpha and then looked at what genes were most upregulated and we weren't really looking for this, but what we found was that out of the top 10 genes upregulated, like eight of them are uh, inflammatory cytokines. And this is an example here of MCAF, monocyte chemotactic and activating factor, where we went ahead and did RNAs protection assay and showing that it's actually markedly upregulated by either TNF alpha or IL-1 alpha or the FAS antibody that triggers the FAS receptor activates it, and uh, similarly the, the proteins uh, uh, appear uh, for MCAF uh, in response to those agents. And this is an example if you scrape a cornea, and if unscraped, if you stain for uh, MCAF protein, you really can't detect any there. But at, at four hours and 24 hours, you see, uh, notice it's away from the epithelium. Why is that? Well, the, the anterior ones have undergone apoptosis, but the, the ones uh, posterior to that are making large amounts of monocyte chemotactic and activating factor. And we went on to show that if you t micro inject some of these different cytokines, you can control which cells actually infiltrate the cornea by which of these factors is micro-injected. So we think the cornea can actually orchestrate its inflammatory response based on you know, toll receptors and other things like that. Uh, you know, what is this invader and can determine which cells are needed in the stroma and produce the proper cytokines to attract mainly a population of the needed cells. Uh, as the, either the corneal fibroblasts or the myofibroblasts produce a lot of extracellular matrix materials uh, and uh, myofibroblasts, uh, it's, it, it's either they make much more or it's much more disorganized and accumulates easier. And uh, the corneal fibroblasts also produce HGF and KGF, which are classical uh, uh, mediators of uh, stromal epithelial interactions. And these growth factors control the recovery of the epithelium uh, by stimulating proliferation, 
migration, differentiation, and apoptosis of the overlying epithelium. So the, the corneal stroma also regulates the healing of the epithelium. And in many of these corneas, depending on the injury, you can get epithelial hyperplasia. Eventually, stromal remodeling uh, of, if it's gonna disappear, those disordered uh, materials must be uh, reorganized so that the collagen fibrils are all the same diameter and, and packed in just the right way to give transparency and a slow return to normalcy. Now, I alluded to uh, the critical role of the basement membranes in this entire process. And we've published a series of, uh, I think, 10 or 12 papers now about this. And it's either the epithelial basement membrane and or decimase basement membrane, depending on the injury. And uh, these are critical in regulating the entry of TGF beta 1 and or TGF beta 2 into the stroma. If the basement membrane is intact, they really can't get in in sufficient levels to drive myofibroblast differentiation. Whereas if they aren't regenerated in a timely manner, then the, uh, those cells appear. And here's the classic picture that kind of led me to all of this work. Uh, the question, why is it that in humans, uh, we only really saw those early on before mitomycin C uh, in corneas with a Visex laser, for example, PRKs over five diopters. Below that, it would be very rare. Now, once in a while, you could see it. Uh, in the rabbit, the nine diopter PRK, you see the scarring fibrosis at one month, which is when it peaks in the rabbit. Whereas in most four and a half diopter PRKs, you don't get that. You may see a little bit of haze at the slit lamp in the stroma, but you certainly don't get uh, the scarring fibrosis. This is the same type of opacity, uh, the scarring fibrosis that you see in many uh, corneal surgeries and, and injuries. For example, here's a buttonhole LASIK flap and you get scarring where the microkeratome broke through the, the epithelium and basement membrane and you get central scarring or around all LASIK flaps, uh, the, that little line there is scarring fibrosis. Uh, a, a place where it's good is when you do a penetrating keratoplasty and the donor recipient interface is full of myofibroblasts. Or here's a bacterial ulcer or herpes simplex, for example. Uh, when they develop scarring, most of that is attributable to myofibroblasts and all of the disordered matrix that they produced. So here we are back to this slide showing that whether or not that basement membrane, epithelial basement membrane regenerates uh, is the determining factor in whether that cornea is gonna de develop scarring fibrosis or not. And once those myofibroblasts develop, they've gotta continue to get ongoing TGF beta uh, or they die and once they die by apoptosis, uh, then uh, corneal fibroblasts and keratocytes can move into that area that they've disappeared from and reorganize all that complex uh, disordered uh, matrix material and return the cornea to transparency. So keep that in mind, the myofibroblasts, if they're gonna survive and persist there, they have to have a source of ongoing TGF beta one, TGF beta two. Um, so two mechanisms we've identified so far that we can stimulate fibrosis is one, if the, if the stromal surface is irregular, then it, it directly mechanically impedes basement membrane regeneration. And that's probably one of the reasons why, uh, say a nine diopter PRK is much more likely with, if you don't use mitomycin C, to get scarring fibrosis than a four and a half, the, the higher your PRK correction, the, the more surface irregularity you get. But there's another important reason, and I showed you those slides where the level of apoptosis is greater with higher corrections. And so 
when, when more of those keratocytes die, then you have less of the, of the cells that can become corneal fibroblasts and keratocytes to repopulate that stroma. And in the 5% of humans that get this, if you gave 100 people nine day after PRK, five or six of them would probably get late haze without mitomycin C. And those are the ones where uh, these two processes, in addition to maybe other things we haven't even identified yet, uh, lead to an inadequacy of these uh, 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 cells. Uh, it, so it's important to know that keratocytes make a lot of the basement membrane components. You know, we call it the epithelial basement membrane, but in many ways it should be called the epithelial stromal basement membrane because the, the uh, uh, keratocytes and corneal fibroblasts make many of those important components to regenerate a normal epithelial basement membrane. And again, this is a human cornea that was removed uh, from an eye that was enucleated for melanoma. And uh, we got permission to do scrape 30 minutes before the enucleation. Take that cornea, stain it for perlican, one of the important components in basement membrane. And all these superficial cells are producing uh, perlican. And the same is true of several other of the basement membrane components. So our working hypothesis is that the healed epithelium, and you've got to have epithelium or you can't even start making the basement membrane because they make the key components. That should be 511, not 51. Uh, oh, it is 511. 511 and 521 laminins are uh, uh, self-polymerizing. They start the process, and they're only made in the epithelium. And once that small monolayers laid down, we postulate that all the more, more posterior components must come from the stromal cells. And this is just kind of a drawing, kind of highlighting that. Um, and you see the normal cornea with the basement membrane intact and growth factors such as TGF-beta and PDGF and the epithelium cannot get through in sufficient amounts to disturb the biology of these keratocyte cells. But if you perform an injury and damage the basement membrane, then they can get in, TGF beta, PDGF, drive the, the uh, development of myofibroblasts. They persist there until such time as corneal fibroblasts fight their way through and actually cooperate them with the epithelium and regenerating a, new, a normal basement membrane. TGF beta gets shut off. The myofibroblasts undergo apoptosis, and over time, the keratocytes and corneal fibroblasts come back in and reabsorb all those abnormal components and return the cornea to transparency. So why does, uh, you know, we, we answered our question, why does 9 diopter PRK get much more haze than a 4 and a half diopter PRK? Uh, well, the two of the factors, and there may be more that we haven't discovered yet, are that the surface is more irregular in higher corrections. And uh, also, you get much greater keratocyte apoptosis, so you have less of these uh, corneal fibroblasts in there to, to come up and cooperate with the epithelium in regenerating an, a normal basement membrane. When I first uh, published that surface irregularity, Paula Vincegara and Dan Epstein uh, in Europe had been proposing in high correction PRKs to do PTK smoothing and that they would get less haze. And a lot of people laughed at them. And they were in the audience when I first uh, uh, showed this work and they both stood up and cheered uh, because their original idea uh, was proven true. Now injuries that the more extensive the keratocyte apoptosis response, the more uh, fibrosis you're going to get. And uh, 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 Gustavo, uh, one of my fellows, uh, did an uh, experiment with me where we infected rabbit corneas with pseudomonas. And after 12 to 24 hours, we would sterilize them with tobramycin drops. And when we did that at one month, there's dense fibrosis in the cornea. And in this particular cornea, the myofibroblast extended far posterior, but not the, all the way to the endothelium. This is at one month. And then this is another cornea at two months, 
which probably started out very similar to the one I just showed you, but in this case, the initial infection went all the way through the cornea and damaged the endothelium. And so at two months, the EBM had regenerated and therefore the, in the anterior cornea, mostly the myofibroblasts had disappeared because these anterior ones cannot be getting sufficient TGF beta to survive. The few arrows here are parasites on blood vessels, which are also SMA positive. Whereas in the posterior cornea, it takes much longer for the endothelium and decimase to recover. And so the aqueous humor and peripheral endothelium are still getting uh, TGF beta from them into the posterior stroma. So these uh, cells are surviving and they will continue to survive there with fibrosis until such time as the endothelium uh, regenerates and, and coordinates with corneal fibroblasts to produce decimase in the posterior cornea. And we've shown that that can occur. Uh, my fellows sitting in the audience did some of that work. Uh, Leisha. And, uh, and uh, then if you look at these same corneas at three months after sterilization or four months, uh, that's not long enough for the endothelium to regenerate and, and produce decimase membrane. So you're still seeing a persistence of these cells. Well, what, which is important, the endothelium or decimase membrane in this process? And uh, with, with uh, Carla Medros, we did an experiment in rabbits where if you remove all, all the central endothelium with a smooth tip cannula by just rubbing it across, uh, you get uh, stromal haze, which is mostly edema, this early after injury at three days. But the cornea very quickly recovers and, you, and uh, re returns to transparency as the endothelium regenerates there and uh, hydration uh, control is reestablished. But if you do a decimase and endothelial removal, eight millimeters, then at two weeks you get scar scarring fibrosis. If this was a slit lamp, you'd see this is all in the posterior cornea. And this is showing it's still there and actually peaks at four to four weeks to several months. Um, so to mention again, if it's a posterior injury, it's, it's the aqueous humor, which is uh, Wayne Stryline and several other people published years ago that aqueous humor had TGF beta one and TGF beta two, maybe coming from the ciliary body, but definitely from endothelial cells too. So just to show a few examples of things, you know, if a patient gets a persistent epithelial defect, regardless of what the etiology is, uh, you basically have a, you know, a few weeks to get that epithelium regenerated. If you don't, you can't begin the process of making an EBM. And so if, from the tear film and uh, residual peripheral epithelium, TGF beta, penetrates at high levels into the stroma and drives the generation of these myofibroblast cells. And so all these corneas develop scarring if you don't get that defect healed in a timely manner. Uh, we've been uh, lucky uh, to have, uh, of course at the time it happened, we didn't think it was lucky, but some of our hundreds of rabbits that have helped us understand these processes after a PRK, some of them develop a persistent epithelial defect. And uh, here's an example of that, uh, where after two weeks, a remaining persistent epithelial defect. And if we look at those with immunohistochemistry, uh, we see that that area where the epithelium has not healed, this is staining for alpha smooth muscle actin, you get a layer of myofibroblast cells at the anterior stromal surface. And not only do they produce scarring, but they can't communicate or they can't contribute to EBM repair with the epithelium. And Siju sitting here has a paper submitted that shows this beautifully in vitro. Uh, so these cells are not only opaque and producing disordered extracellular matrix, but they can't cooperate with the epithelium to regenerate. And so it, it kind of stimulates a a persistence 
of that, that uh, epithelial defect. And this is just an EM showing one of these myofibroblasts in, in this persistent uh, epithelial defect. In a lot of these corneas, with PRK especially, uh, they can recover over time. And in the, uh, before we used mitomycin, unfortunately, I, I had some of these patients. And this is an example of, of one of the actual patients where um, over time, in the haze, you start seeing clear areas, which we call clinically lacunae. And those, we know now that those are areas where the basement membrane got repaired, the associated myofibroblasts underwent apoptosis, and in those clear areas, the process of getting rid of the uh, uh, disordered extracellular matrix has gone, and these usually coalesce over time, and the whole cornea can return to clarity. And I'm just showing, you know, if you stain a particular cornea, you may only detect one or two of these myofibroblasts undergoing apoptosis at one time point. But over time, many of them die and eventually the corneal fibroblasts and keratocytes can come back in, return to transparency. So another example is breakthrough haze. Even in this era of using mitomycin C in, in most corneas that have PRK, once in a while, we'll get what's called breakthrough haze which means we got the haze despite mitomycin C treatment. And um, if you see one of these, they're typically very resistant to recovery. That haze can persist much longer than a cornea that didn't get the mitomycin. And we think that's because the mitomycin uh, decreases keratocyte density in general in the anterior stroma and it may alter for a long time uh, keratocyte function, and it makes it harder to get rid of this. Uh, we still use it because these are very rare, and it would be much more common if we didn't use the mitomycin, and we haven't seen any other problems with it in over 20 years of use. There are some forms of haze in the cornea that, that are not myofibroblasts. So when you do a normal PRK, you may see a little stromal haze that's from the corneal fibroblast making their uh, uh, smaller amounts or different types of, of glycosaminoglycans and collagens, or a, a normal cross-linking procedure. If there's a, the haze that you see normally in those, uh, it's not myofibroblasts. Now, either one of those can have an abnormal response and end up with a persistent epithelial defect and get myofibroblasts, but that's way less common. How mitomycin itself works gets into this whole process, and that is that uh, with Marcelo Neto, years ago we published that uh, if what happens is the mitomycin C uh, uh, gets in and inhibits the mitosis, this is KI67 staining, of, of these anterior stromal cells, whereas in the BSS treated, you hit, get huge amount of proliferation of these stromal cells. And this effect of mitomycin C persists for you know, several months. And uh, that, that's how the mitomycin C actually works, inhibiting the proliferation of the, pro, the progenitors to the myofibroblasts. Okay, so let's get to, what time is it? Okay, so let's get to some of these actual new magic bullets that we have. One that's available on the market right now is topical recombinant human uh, NGF, uh, Oxervate, uh, Dome produces that, uh, and um, we know that the normal epithelium uh, NGF from the corneal nerves uh, is actually a part of the physiology of the epithelium, and they get sickly if they don't have those nervous impulses. And this happens in PRK transiently because uh, another study by Carla Medros that she actually won the Troutman Award for showed that when you do a PRK, you get axonal degeneration of the neurons uh, 
uh, in the, in the uh, corneal stroma and they regenerate, but it takes some time. So for a while, you have a neurotrophic cornea there. And in patients that get a neurotrophic cornea uh, with per, uh, persistent epithelial defect, uh, the, the clinical trials showed that the uh, NGF delivered every two hours, six times daily uh, for eight weeks was highly effective in uh, stimulating healing of that epithelium. And if they don't completely heal, you can repeat that uh, process. Uh, and so we do have a way of modulating this. The problem with these corneas is by the time they get started on NGF, it's usually been a month or two or three and so they all have corneal fibrosis. So yes, you can save the cornea and save the eye uh, by using it, but still the function is often compromised because they've developed scarring fibrosis. Uh, but still, it's a, it's a very useful agent. Uh, along with Dr. Goshi, uh, uh, we've treated, I've treated a couple patients, he's treated many more, and it's been pretty effective treatment for these patients that in the past we really didn't have much treatment for. Topical Lasartan. Uh, about six, five, six years ago, uh, as we were in the midst of all of our studies on TGF-beta and corneal wound healing, I became aware of the fact that Lasartan actually interferes with TGF-beta signaling. And so I thought, hmm, I wonder if that Lasartan could be used to block or treat or both fibrosis. Uh, first, I had to get funding, and uh, the funding I was able to finally get just over three years ago was a DOD grant, and they were interested in endothelial injury and repair. So that's the first model we studied. And um, Here's a, a photograph, what happens, remember if you injure the endothelium only, this is at one month after, the, the endothelial cells recover and you don't get any of these myofibroblasts. This is keratin's, keratocan staining of normal keratocytes just throughout the whole stroma. Whereas in the cornea where you receive removed decimase and endothelium, you get severe stromal fibrosis. This is myofibroblast stain for alpha smooth muscle actin, whereas the anterior cornea, you still have the normal keratocytes. Well, we proposed using that model to study Lasartan, and voila, uh, I still remember uh, when we started seeing this starting to happen, the excitement of finding this, this is a, we, we looked at both oral and topical. And the oral dose of Lasartan we gave was far greater than humans take for hypertension. We worked with the, with the veterinarians to, what was the maximum oral dose we could give? And they got five milligrams per kilogram three times a day of the oral dose. And uh, for the topical, uh, turns out we were using 0 0.1. We thought we were using 0 0.4, but we were only able at that time to obtain pills of Lasartan and subsequently found out that they're only 25% Lasartan. So the actual concentration we used in those studies was 0 0.1 milligram per ml of Lasartan and no effect either oral or topical on the unwounded cornea. So that there's no toxicity that we see. If you, if you look at the control treated with vehicle, you get fibrosis of the entire cornea with this eight millimeter, extending all the way out to the limbus. The oral had no effect. We could see no benefit whatsoever of oral alone Lasartan. In the topical Lasartan, boom. It's clearing, remember this is only one month, clearing from the periphery, and in this particular cornea, you're actually seeing a lacune of clearing extending towards the central cornea. If you combine the two, you got no added effect from having the oral. You got the same result that you got, and you see that graphically here. Either the topical asartan or the combined topical oral were just about the same in the level of intensity of the scarring fibrosis. So not only is the volume of the fibrosis decreasing, but its intensity in the center, you see these circles are where we actually did the analysis with image J, uh, was decreasing by one month. 
If you took these corneas and did immunohistochemistry uh, for alpha smooth muscle actin and keratin, keratocan for keratocytes, you see that in the unwounded corneas, uh, you don't see any of the myofibroblasts. Whereas in the vehicle, you get, and it's the volume and the thickness that's greater of this posterior fibrotic layer. Whereas in the topical Lasartan, it's much less thick and much less density of these myofibroblasts. This was the best one of all. Of course, I'm gonna show that in the picture where there was just a little bit of the myofibroblast left. The oral had basically no effect and the combined was similar uh, to the topical. Another thing we discovered in this study and other ones that we've done is that the corneal fibroblasts in the cornea make a lot of collagen type four. If they're near the basement membrane, that's probably helping to regenerate the membrane uh, or decimates membrane, but it's throughout the whole posterior stroma, well away from, and collagen four binds TGF-beta-1 and TGF-beta-2 and prevents them from binding to cognate receptors. So we came to realize that the, the, the corneal fibroblasts are actually trying to control that TGF-beta that's coming in. And uh, the Losartan uh, suppressed that. Uh, so the topical Losartan or the combined topical and oral, you get markedly decreased collagen four production by corneal fibroblasts all the way to the endothelium. You don't need the collagen four if, the, if the, uh, you're blocking TGF beta signaling with the Losartan. But what this shows is the Losartan goes all the way to the endothelium when applied typically, topically, which was a really important realization. Uh, with Leisha and the others in my lab, we went on to do a study uh, alkali burns, uh, this is one normal sodium hydroxide for 30 seconds uh, in these corneas, and you can see four in each group. In the, in the vehicle-treated group, uh, uh, fibrosis much larger, extending out to almost the edge of the cornea, and you also get a lot more neovascularization, which is an interesting finding that Losartan may have some effect in impeding that process. If you, used, if you use topical Losartan, the, the density of that and also the area of it is diminished at one month after treatment with this time 0.2 milligram per ml uh, six times a day. Prednisolone acetate itself does a pretty good job uh, in this particular model of limiting the amount of fibrosis over time, but it's really the combination of the two in this highly inflammatory model turned out to be the most uh, consistent if you, uh, in terms of the opacity area or that the total opacity in pixels measured with image J, you get a, the Sartan does a pretty good job by itself, but you get a much tighter spread if you combine the Losartan with topical corticosteroid. Uh, and this is some of the immunohistochemistry in those for both alpha smooth muscle actin marker for myofibroblasts and the keratocan marker for keratocytes. And we see no myofibroblasts uh, in the uh, unwounded cornea. In the ones treated with BSS, it extends, the fibrosis extends all the way through the cornea. With Losartan, it was only in the most posterior part of the cornea. In prednisone acetate, it worked some, but it was highly variable. So I'm showing you two of these corneas. In one of them, the fibrosis was only present in the very posterior, but in another couple of them, it was all the way through. So it wasn't nearly as effective as the Losartan. But when you combine them both in this particular highly inflammatory model, you saw your, your best effect. And whether you looked at the total alpha smooth muscle actin area or the total opacity using MHJ, uh, they, with the combining of the two, gave a much tighter spread to the data on the low end. So, so in highly inflammatory models, it's probably gonna be that you're gonna wanna use both 
uh, steroid and losartan, whereas in th things like PRK, which is not that inflammatory like an alkali burn, uh, you, you probably don't need the steroid for the most part, uh, especially after a week when you could have traumatic keratitis to the cornea or something. So when these, pa these cases, uh, first author on these is Lisha uh, Samponia, who's sitting in the audience. And we published, the first one was in January of this year, 2022. And the alkali burn was in June or something. People, uh, I, I've trained like uh, 15 Brazilian uh, cornea and refractive surgeons. A lot of them saw these papers and predictably in Brazil, they don't, uh, especially here at an academic institution like the Cleveland Clinic, I can't just march down the street and have certain drops made. We have to go through uh, FDA approval. People in private practice here can probably do that though. They can go down to a custom form pharmacy because it's approved and, and used for hypertension in millions of people. It still needs to undergo toxicity studies and we're gonna do that. Uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Dr. Goshi and one of our fellows, uh, Dr. Boston, are uh, gearing up to do a human phase one trial of topical asartan. But uh, uh, and Renato Ambrosio Jr., who's one of my first fellows from Brazil, uh, saw this and we talked about it and he had a patient referred to him in, Jan in December of last year, uh, when he was aware of, of this information, uh, after the patent was submitted, I might say, and that I told him about it. And he had a patient referred to him that had a complicated LASIK in which the, there was a lost fla a flap or a displacement. The patient developed massive DLK, diffuse lamellar keratitis, and severe stromal fibrosis limiting the vision to 2200 and uh, started uh, topical asartan 0.8 milligram per ml, which is the concentration we recommend in humans now, uh, six times per day. And over time, complete resolution of that stromal haze. And this case is in press right now in Journal of Refractive Surgery, and I think it's coming out in November. Another one of my fellows, Rodrigo de Oliveras, uh, who was aware of this work, uh, had a patient come in that had had RK many years ago, but came in and was developing neovascularization and stromal fibrosis uh, affecting visual acuity and began the patient, and this is after only 15 days. I think the patient has continued to get even better, but look at the marked decrease in the stromal fibrosis and the neovascularization in this eye in response to topical asartan. It's very important to realize that when fibrosis develops, it's just not a stationary scar. It still has active myofibroblasts in it that, that maintain that scar, and if they uh, get their TGF beta cut off, then they will undergo apoptosis and then the corneal fibroblasts and keratocytes can come in and, and uh, restore that uh, transparency. So Lasartan will work not only prophylactically, which is kind of what our studies in rabbits so far have been, but it will also work in established scars. Now we don't know if, is that true 10 years later? Well, we're gonna find out because People all over the world are now getting this made up until the time that some company licenses this technology and, and in the, at least in the countries where that patent is enforced, uh, they're going to have to buy it from a pharmacy, uh, from that pharmaceutical company. But in the meantime, I encouraged people all over the world, you know, I don't want to withhold this technology because it's really benefiting the lives of, of so many patients. But keep that in mind, both prophylactic and once it's developed, it has the potential to improve. So some of the examples where I see topical Losartan with or without corticosteroid, depending on the degree of inflammation, being highly effective in treating human patients. 
uh, thermal and chemical burns, bacterial, fungal, acanthamoeba, or whatever infection, uh, microbial infection, for both prophylaxis, so beginning it at the time of diagnosis with the antibiotics that you're gonna give, fortified typically if it's a bad ulcer, uh, or uh, treatment, patients that had a corneal scar three years ago, and I've got a bunch of these people in my practice, I'm just dying to treat with Losartan every time I see them. I'm like, why can't I get Losartan? Uh, so we wanna try that. Or herpes simplex, if they've had a recurrent episode, the recurrences and especially how many times it's recurred, the, the, the chance for getting scarring fibrosis increases. And I think that uh, for recurrent herpes simplex, that we're gonna see Losartan become a standard of care in addition to the antivirals that are delivered to control the virus itself. Patients with shingles, if they get uh, uh, stromal fibrosis or corneal involvement, I see it being used in them with the antivirals. Uh, chemical burns, uh, burns from bioweapons, I actually have a new NIH grant submitted uh, where we're gonna look at sulfur mustard burns in rabbit models, and no, we're not bringing sulfur mustard to the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, those exposures are gonna be done at a governmental facility in Kansas City, and at one day after exposure, there's no longer any risk to any personnel, it's all gone, and those can be transported here to the Cleveland Clinic, and we're gonna hopefully start those studies in July of next year. Corneal lacerations, or I just showed you an example of late scarring after RK, I think it's gonna be useful in breakthrough haze, for example, which is very frustrating. If you get a breakthrough haze, we know that if you try to remove it with PTK, you're probably just gonna make it worse. Uh, and the corticosteroids in most of those eyes are not gonna be effective. But I see Lysartan uh, being highly effective or in complicated cross-linking with a persistent epithelial defect. Um, any type of persistent epithelial defect. Remember, when a per patient gets persistent epithelial defect, you have a few weeks to try to get that healed or the myofibroblasts are gonna develop there. And once they develop there, not only is there opacity, but you don't have any corneal fibroblasts. Myofibroblasts can't deliver. They may make some of the basement membrane components, but we've shown they can't be properly inserted into the nascent epithelial basement membrane. And so you have a barrier there preventing that normal communication between epithelium and corneal fibroblasts. So, so not only do you wanna get the epithelium healed, but you'd like to get rid of those uh, myofibroblasts. So I see the topical NGF and the topical Losartan being used hand in hand to treat those patients in the future. Losart, there's many other drugs in this category of angiotensin converting enzyme two receptor inhibitors. And we've patented all of them. Uh, but in looking at a couple of them, uh, uh, most of them are insoluble in our buffer, which doesn't mean they couldn't be used, but they'd have to have a special vehicle, like Restasis had a special vehicle for cyclosporin A, which was insoluble. We could probably use similar ve vehicles for these other ACE2 inhibitors, but, but we have good solubility with Losartan in just regular balanced salt solution. And I think one of the patients in Brazil they went ahead and used normal saline as the vehicle and it worked fine that too. But we're encouraging people to stick to the BSS because that's where we've seen the best. And those recipes are in, in our papers that have been published in rabbits. So you can, you can pick those up there. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence of ocular toxicity in these eyes, which is a huge advantage uh, to Losartan. Uh, and I've had the fellows in Brazil ask the patients if it stings, like restasis, it doesn't sting. So uh, uh, that's gonna improve compliance, and so I think that uh, uh, that's a real big reason for using Losartan. And also we now have three models. We've also recently had accepted for publication in JRS, uh, also first authored by Alicia, uh, on PRK and rabbits uh, treated 
uh, prophylactically with losartan, and it decreased uh, scarring haze and decreased myofibroblast generation in the corneas that were treated with topical losartan. Uh, and that was also 0.2 milligrams per mL six times a day. And we went to a month. Uh, whenever we submit one of these papers, we always get a reviewer that says, well, this is great, but you should have treated him for six months. And I, I usually put in, I'll be happy to treat him for six months. Will you please provide the funding? Because every rabbit costs $500, and every day they're here, I forget what the charge is now. Is it six and a half dollars a day and increasing every year? You add that up to 100 rabbits, and you're talking real money. Uh, you, I'm willing to accept Bitcoin. Um, so another, another group in this, of these uh, magical bullets are the neovascularization uh, new ones coming out. Uh, these two are approved for uh, cancer treatment, uh, centinib and actinib. Uh, but there have been some limited studies in, in animal models showing that they're effective in treating in suture-induced neovascularization or cautery-induced neovascularization. And we need human trials for these agents. I showed you we, we suspect that losartan itself is inhibiting the growth of these neovascular vessels, and we're actually gonna look at that in our new DOD grant, and also in the uh, bioweapons uh, grant if, if it's funded. But we need human trials to look at these, but I think they have an enormous future. Now, rho kinase or ROC inhibitors, uh, human corneal endothelial cells, most people say they don't proliferate. Well, that's not true. Uh, we showed many years ago that if you take human corneal endothelial cells and you transduce them with E6, E7 oncogenes, that they start proliferating like crazy. And they'll, they'll, pop, they'll uh, mitose for over 100 population doublings. We actually never reached the end of it. We could even use Fuchs endothelial cells from a donor, uh, a recipient button, put it in culture, the decimase, only a few cells are there. But if we hit them with E6, E7 and transduce that gene into them, those cells will proliferate also over 100 population doublings. Uh, and we couldn't, once they started doing that, we couldn't tell a difference between those endothelial cells and normal endothelial cells, calling into question, what is the real defect in, in Fuchs dystrophy? And that, that's something very interesting to me. Well, uh, Shigeru Kinoshita, and his colleagues in Japan in 2016 showed that any one of these three uh, topical rock inhibitors uh, would, inhi would stimulate the proliferation, improve adhesion, decrease apoptosis of uh, corneal epithelial cells from humans or primates or, poor, or pigs or rabbits both in vitro and in vivo. And I think that partly helped him win the, one of the Friedenwald Proctor Awards a couple of years ago. Um, in the United States, we have one of these approved for glaucoma. Turns out they also can be effective uh, for uh, glaucoma. And natarsidil, 0.2% is available uh, for clinical use in the United States. And a couple of early reports have come out. Davies et al. reported that the topical application of this medication after desmetorexis without endothelial transplant, in other words, you just remove in a human patient, um, that there was a significant reduction in the time to corneal clearing and increased corneal endothelial cell density in the eyes that were treated with, with the medication compared to patients where it was delayed and, and they did get it later in the study. And then Price and Price found a reduction in corneal edema in a prospective trial of 0.02% uh, nitrosidil uh, versus vehicle once a day for three months in symptomatic Fuchs dystrophy eyes. So this is just the beginning. 
I think we're going to see a lot of use of not only this one, but other ones as they get approved in the United States for injuries involving the endothelium, which could be an alkali burn, could be surgical induced, could be disease induced. So I think uh, multi-drug therapy is going to be the future using these, these and other agents that I haven't even discussed today. For example, for persistent epithelial defects, as I mentioned, I see the topical NGF and Losartan being used hand in hand to better treat those patients. Or um, if, if a patient has endothelial injury from endotheliitis or, or a desmetal rexus without transplant, uh, combining the ROC inhibitor with Losartan uh, to simultaneously stimulate the regeneration of the endothelium and prevent the development of fibrosis. So that's where we stand. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot more work on Losartan going forward. And uh, I think uh, that we're going to find that probably uh, my prediction is 10 years from now that uh, topical Losartan and maybe other uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor inhibitors will be routinely used in ophthalmology practice uh, to prevent and treat scarring fibrosis and with these other drugs depending on the injury.